anyone who's listening is like, wow, like to go to vet school in your late 30s, that is a risk forward. That is like a, it's a real pivot. And I think that's massive. What allowed you or enabled you to start to think like that? Oh, lots of things. I think I've sort of, if I look back on what I've done with my life, I've always sort of risked forward a bit. I've always done things and thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And if it works out great, and if it doesn't, so what? Um, So I think that kind of attitude really did help. Welcome to the Absolute Dog Sex in a Squirrel podcast. I'm Lauren Langman. I'm one of the world's leading dog trainers, and it's my mission to help owners become their dog's top priority. In each episode, you'll discover how to gain trust and communicate with your dog like never before, creating unbreakable bonds that make you the most exciting part of their world. Hello and welcome to the Sex in a Squirrel podcast, the podcast that gives you real life results. And today I am joined by the wonderful Kate. Kate, we're going to be talking about risking forwards and how you've pivoted a little bit later to become a vet. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tell us what an adventure you're on. Well, goodness, a huge adventure. Um, So I am currently at vet school in Nottingham in my third year, which was a complete change from what I had been doing. I was a human physio. Um, And this all stems because I always wanted to be a vet and never got in when I was 18. Did a lot of other stuff. And then COVID happened. And I just thought, am I really happy? Like, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? And I was like, don't think I really do um and so I just thought you know I'll give it one last shot I'll apply see what happens and here I am wow now I'm sure you won't mind showing roughly how old when you applied oh late 30s like like 30. how mega is that yeah. how mega is that high five high five thank you <laughs> right. that's mega and what allowed you to risk forward like that because I think anyone who's listening is like wow like to go to vet school in your late 30s that is a risk forward. That is like a, it's a real pivot. And I think that's massive. What allowed you or enabled you to start to think like that? Oh, lots of things, I think. So I've got a really supportive husband and and he was like, absolutely go for it. So I think that really, really helps. And he's been behind me 100% as after the rest of my family, to be fair. But I think I've sort of, if I look back on what I've done with my life, I've always sort of risked forward a bit. I've always done things and thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And if it works out great, and if it doesn't, I, so what? Um, so I think that kind of attitude really did help. Um, I didn't tell anyone that I'd applied. I just applied kind of in secret. I told Guy, my husband, and that was it. Because I thought, you know, if I don't get in, I don't want to have to tell everyone I haven't got in. Um, but I just thought, well, what have I got to lose? Like if I apply and I don't get in, I'm in no different position to what I was. But if I did get in, like how amazing would that be? That's mega. That is mega. So tell us, how has the adventure been so far? What have you been up to? How is it? Um, how is it turning out? Like, what's it like? It's brilliant. Like it's absolutely everything that I could have ever wanted. So the first couple of years, you do loads of anatomy. So that's been really interesting. And we do it across all the species. So small animals, all the exotics, the farm animals, horses, all of them. So that's what the first two years is mostly about. And then in year three, you start to do a little bit more kind of clinical stuff. So we've learned about anesthetics um, and about some skin conditions um, and just how like theatre works and learning how to suture a little bit. So that's really cool. Um, and then alongside that, in all our holidays, we have to do placements. So I've done 12 weeks of what we call kind of animal handling placements. So that's in dairies and on sheep farms, lambing and doing that kind of stuff. And then I've just started. I've just come back from my first two weeks of clinical placement with the vets. So that's where I'm up to at the moment. That's mega. And you were with a mixed practice, you were just telling that's me. Right. Tell me what that means and what that looks like. And how was that for you? Uh, it was brilliant. I learned absolutely loads. So mixed practice is one that does both farm animals. Sometimes they do equine as well and small animals as well. So we would be in consults seeing dogs and cats in the morning and then we'd be going off to farms to do stuff in, in the afternoon. And then there might be some surgery and then more farm stuff and then more more small animal consults. It was really, really good. And it was really good to see how kind of the skills you you learn on your small animals are really transferable to your larger animals as well. Um, and it was also really good to be out and about in the countryside a little bit as well, rather than just being in a consulting room all day. So I, I had a great time and the vets there were super lovely and, and really like it's really lovely to be in an environment where they want to teach you and they let you have a go at things and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a really positive experience. Because I know even from um, like we own um, goats, we have sheep, we have chickens and we have ponies. I feel very grateful for that. Uh, and actually I just know how we are for sure that we you can't take them to the vets every time you can't always bundle them in the car or the horse box and sometimes it's not appropriate because the animal's not well enough to travel or because you can't travel them or you haven't physically got the horse box to get them there quick enough so actually 
there's a massive place for that, isn't there? And what a variety. Like if I was to think about like the James Herriot sort of days and and how I feel a, a I feel there are vets and there are vets and and one of my absolute favorite vets, her name is Bryony. She just she's like James Herriot for me. And she's like one of my previous vets, actually. My previous vet was a really fantastic vet and her name was Alison. They remind me of each other a lot. And Alison died for um very young from from cancer. And she was always in my house and she was always acupuncturing the dogs and she was always helping us. And if ever one of the dogs was in pup, she would do like a little pendulum and she would tell me with a pendulum. She wouldn't scan them. She'd tell me the <laughs> pendulum. So she was just a bit like magic, really. She was just lovely, like really wonderful woman. And she'd be in my living room and just like just a great vet. And it's it's not really I don't feel it's a it's necessarily just a career I feel it's a lifestyle with those vets and and those are the people that I look for in like in in treating my dogs and Bryony for me really stands out for that reason but when you think about the what she does with the mixed practice like yes she can treat my goat yes she can treat my um dog yes she can help me with the chicken I mean I sent her a picture of the chicken not that long ago and said look the fox has had this chicken what do I need to do because I want to make the chicken better but I don't really know where to start do I need antibiotics do I need this do I need that she's like no antibiotics saline solution heat and warmth and in a safe space and quiet and put them with another chicken that's not like just peck them and keep them here and she's great like great and like what a variety right yeah, and I think it's right that you talk about that relationship you have with your vet because I think that's really key. It's like with anything, um, you know, you, you, you're talking to somebody about something that's really important to your, your pets or your livestock or whatever that may be, and you need to have a good relationship with them. And I think at vet school, they're really good at teaching us like, okay, you're going to treat animals, but you have to have that relationship with the human end as well. Otherwise, you, you know, you're just not going to get anywhere. I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. And I think like my relationship with her, I hope she would say the same, but I really value her as a vet. I think she's really good. And we're about to take our dogs abroad. And when we take them abroad, like you need all of the paperwork done and you need everything to be like ticked and dotted and crossed and all the all the things. But I've also rang her at two in the morning and said, look, we've got a problem and, and we need help. Like, so like, I love having that relationship. And, and it would really scare me actually to have to start a new relationship with a vet tomorrow. Like that's, that's big, isn't it? Because it is a personal thing, your vet. Completely. And I'm in that exact position. We've recently moved. Um, some of my dogs need um, vaccinations and I've now got to find a new vet. And I, I think I've been, I've actually been putting it off. And this is dreadful, isn't it? Like, you know, I've been actually putting it off because the the effort that it takes to find a vet that works for you, not only the person, but the practice as well, their protocols and all the rest of it. I'm like, oh, goodness, I just don't want to have to do this. So, yeah. You have to align, don't you? You really have to align. And uh, I'm terrible when I ring up. I'm like, um, can I make an appointment for Bryony, please? <laughs> They're always like, they try and give me another vet, and I'm like, this one only. Um, <laughs> I agree, it's something that's really precious to you. And and I, another one that she really understands for me, which I really appreciate, is she understands that Brave doesn't want to go in the car. So Brave doesn't want to travel. Since Brave had her spinal accident, she doesn't want to travel. And so I don't want to stress her out. So I love that Bryony will pop to the house and she'll pop in and she'll pop in for a cuppa. Like, oh my goodness, I just feel so grateful. Now, Tell me one of your high points, Kate. So one of your high points. So, so far, one of your high moments, something you've done. Like Liza came home the other day and she's like, mommy, I chopped up her heart. And I was like, oh, really? And she said, yes. I said, what did you do with it after? She said, we, 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 we got rid of it. I was like, you could have fed it to one of the dogs, Liza. Like, come on. And um, so anyway, she was telling me all about chopping up hearts. And um, what's been one of your high moments? I think one of my high moments has been lambing, actually. I really, really oh. enjoyed it. And I've done it every year as well. So I've done it three times now. And I can see myself getting better and more confident and more able to deal with some of the trickier presentations. So I think that probably has been my absolute high point. Okay, tell me then. I'm going to ask for tips here. I've got sheep and yeah. we've never had any lambs and not really for not like it. I love lambs. I just don't know what we do with them. Number one. Number two, I don't know how it all works. Like, I mean, I know how it works, but not how it works. So how... How does it happen? So lambing, like, why do you need to be involved? Or do you need to be involved? Like, why do the lambs not just happen? So they, they mostly do. It depends what breed of sheep you have as well. So some of the breeds, like with the bigger heads, like the Texels, they sometimes are more difficult to, to birth just because their heads are a bit bigger. Um, some of the sheep, some of them might, might be coming breech, for example, they might be coming backwards. So you might need to give them a hand there. 
Sometimes if you've got um, ewes and it's the first time lambing, they can be a bit smaller if they're a bit younger. So that can sometimes be a bit problematic. Um, and then I guess you've got the ones that kind of, they cook them, they cook their lambs a little bit longer, so they're a bit bigger. And then that can be a problem getting them to come out as well. So you don't always have to be involved. It, you know, if, if you only got a small flock, you might not need to be involved at all, to be honest. But on bigger flocks, you are, you are going to have to give some of them a little bit of a helping hand. OK, so we've got six Hebrideans. Give me advice. I think I think Hebs are pretty good at lambing quite easily. So I don't think I don't think you'd be too much problem. You can no also, marigolds. Absolutely no marigolds. No. Um you could also ask your your um, your vet Bryony, she would come out and maybe give you a, a hand or, or at least talk you through what you need, the kind of equipment you might need. Equipment? You need equipment. Well, you need your gloves and you need your, um, your lubricant and you need some iodine solution for the navels and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you do need a few bits and pieces. Oh, my. Right. I'm ready for our next phone call. Yes, um, so, absolutely. Too funny. Um, and so that's been one of your highs. Have there been any lows so far? Yeah, I think definitely. Like it's quite stressful, particularly coming up to exam time. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot of material to kind of remember. It's a lot of material to regurgitate in the exam. And I think that that's pretty stressful. Um, so, yeah, I think I think just that kind of overall kind of, you know, like you put your whole life into it, like your whole like I'm 100 percent dedicated to this. And this thought that I might not pass an exam is quite terrifying. So I think that's a low in as you know that's the that's the worst it gets for me at the moment I think just that kind of exam stress now possibly a personal question but how are you managing to fund it Kate like how does it even work has it been expensive is it something that's difficult to do like how does that work so I'm really lucky that I worked all the way through COVID and didn't have very many outgoing expenses. I managed to save quite a lot of money, um, but it is expensive. And I have two jobs as well and um, I work part time. Um, so that is a bit of a balancing act, balancing kind of family life, the dogs, work and, you know, studying as well. So, yes, it is a challenge. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that is ongoing, isn't it? It's a balancing oh, it's act. Hearted. Yeah. And what are you most excited about? I'm kind of really excited for my placements this summer, actually, because I've got we've done a little bit of clinical stuff. So I know a little bit more. So when I go in, I'll just I'll have like more knowledge to ask questions and I'll be learning a lot more because I have a bit more of a baseline. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see that. And I'm I'm going back to a, play, um, a practice that I went to last year as well. So I know them already. So that'd be really nice kind of to see them all again. They were all really lovely um, and to work with them again. So, yeah, that that's kind of what I'm looking forward to this summer for sure. And has it changed your approach to your own dogs in any way? No, I don't think it has at all. In fact, I kind of so we did a project this year, third year. We had to do a little little, little mini, mini dissertation and I did mine on um, kind of dog friendly vets practices um, and how we could kind of look to move forward with that. And, um, you know, with some of the kind of current thinking so, um, no, it hasn't really changed any of my views on my dogs. In fact, it's made me more keen to make sure all of our dogs have a better experience at the vets. And I'm not saying that they don't have a good experience, but I'm, there is lots of stuff that we could do better, I think, both oh, from his perspective and from a vet's perspective. I'm, I'm huge on advocating, as you know, for our dogs in vet practices. And yeah. recently, my dogs typically don't have vaccinations um, traditionally and haven't for, for many years. But they do have um, a rabies jab if they need to travel, because obviously that's the regulation to travel. Yeah. And so that's kind of forced, really. And so when I had them rabies vaccinated the other day, for some of them, that's their first experience of that. And I was very clear that we were going to do it in my living room. And I was very clear that the way we would do it. And I was very clear of who would be present because I didn't even want each other of the dogs to be present, because mm -hmm. if one of them squeaks, the other one's like, hey, what's happening? She's squeaking. And you should see Brave. Like Brave obviously isn't traveling with us, but Brave, um, Brave doesn't like travel. Um, but Brave, if if anybody squeaks, Brave is like, oh my God, someone just died. Someone died. Like, and she's like shaking and she's salivating. I'm like, Brave, no one died. Everyone's fine. Yeah. Nothing has happened. But she she doesn't even like dogs having their nails clipped, like other dogs. That's or right. if you're going to like, I don't know, say you're going to chip something or you're going to vaccinate something or you're going to cut nails or you're going to do anything at all that's a little bit clinical vet type work, yeah. she's done. So I, I think advocating for our dogs is massive. Go on, give us one thing that you think could could get better or you could help improve or you would like to see more of for advocating. Well, for you know, something really simple, that like dog's not waiting in the waiting room. 
So at my old vet, so I was telling you, wasn't I, that um, I've got this trauma because I've got to find a new vet. One of the reasons we were at our old vets, and they were about, they were a good 45 minute drive from us, is because they had those buzzer things. You know, like when you go to, out to dinner and you get a buzzer and it buzzes when your food is ready. They had that system. So you went in alone, um, picked up your buzzer, went back to your car, and then it buzzed when the vet was ready. And that was just brilliant because there was no waiting in waiting rooms. So something as simple as that, you know, is just absolutely brilliant for all dogs. It doesn't matter if they're a naughty but nice dog or, you know, you're perfectly happy go lucky Labrador. It doesn't really matter. I just think it, it's less stress. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love that buzzer idea. Normally you like buzz for like takeaways or pizzas, but buzz for vets. Maybe a vet with a pizza. Yeah, I think it could really work in a vet and a coffee and a pizza. Um, So in terms of your next few years, how do they look? Um, so year four starts the clinical teaching. So it's, you know, all the diseases and the, the kind of treatments for those. Um, and then we do, so year four starts in September, runs through to March, April time exams. And then we start our fifth year rotation. So I have no summer holidays after fourth year. We head straight into rotations, whereas you're effectively being a vet for about eight months, um, a bit like doctors. Um, so, yeah, so then then it really gets real which is exciting and also slightly terrifying too, but more exciting. Now, I know we touched on this away from our podcast, but during this podcast, it'd be great to tell people, where are you thinking about working long term? Because obviously you've got the love of dogs and you've got the love of all animals, but what do you think your area will be? Oh, that's a really good question, Lauren. And luckily I don't have to commit to anything just yet. I, th- I do think mixed practice would be really interesting. Um, I, I went into vet med thinking I'd do dogs, that I'd do kind of rehab maybe with my physio background, maybe some chronic pain stuff. Um, but I really enjoyed some of my time on farms and I really think you could make a real difference in animal welfare at a farm level. So I am sort of thinking about mixed practice. Um, yeah, but it, it doesn't matter at the moment. I don't have to like commit firmly at the moment, which is really good because I'm sort of erring between the two at the moment. Oh, it's brilliant. I think the idea of getting to do mixed practice will be amazing. And I also think the variety you'll get through doing it, like my goats make me laugh every day. The chickens are hilarious. The dogs are brilliant. We've got a feral cat. We've got ponies. Like I can't imagine working with just one of those groups. I love I love working with all of them. And I love that my vet, Bryony, she works with all of them. And I think that that's got to give you a lot of variety. And I know you like variety. Absolutely. I think it'll keep me on my toes. That'd be good. So what does uh, your partner think of this whole adventure guy, brilliant guy? What does he think? Oh, he's really supportive. He, he, I think he knew how much I wanted to be a vet. Like he's always known that it was something that I wasn't successful at, you know, the first time around. And it's always been one of those little niggles, you know, like you suppress it deep down and all the right, you don't really think about it every day, but you, there is that little niggle that says, oh, I really wish. And I think he was in a similar situation as well. So he started a PhD when he was much younger, didn't finish it and has just um, over the last few years got another PhD and has has been doing that and is just about to finish his his PhD. So I think he kind of it resonates for him in that way. So, yeah, he's, he's just been brilliant. Now, I don't know if you know this, Kate, but before I was ever a lawyer a teacher a dog trainer or any of those things I definitely wanted to be a vet oh, did you? yeah absolutely it was 100% from when I was about seven years old I wanted to be a vet and it was absolutely my number one thing and and always advocating and wanting for just the best conditions that we could for our, our dogs and my cats but we had cats growing up as well um and I went to the vets when I was about nine years old and the vets injected one of our cats it was with my nan I was in Columpton in the vet practice in Columpton and I fainted and my nan said to me she can never be a vet because she can't stand needles and I know that sounds crazy but that stayed with me a long time Mm. and I can inject my dogs now because I do um if I need to like one of mine two of mine actually have immunotherapy and uh that's regular and I can inject myself. I have B12. So I take B12. I take it to, depending on how I feel, but sometimes I take it weekly. Uh, and sometimes I take it less than that. Uh, and I think it really helps. And I also can inject Matt and I've injected my dad with some of his cancer sort of uh, vitamins and, and things that he has to take, which I don't even understand what they are half the time, but he tells me they're supposed to happen. Nurses say they're supposed to happen. And he can't always do the injections because of where they are and because of his mobility now. And so I can do it. And I think it all comes down to your passion and your mission. And as much as I think I'm really happy on my path, I think one thing I'd love everyone to take away from this is don't ever let somebody else's um, 
judgment or thinking like rule yours and I know that if I was a vet I can tell you right now there is no way I'd be walking working in small animal only because I think that to be in a room like all day every day would be killer however to make a difference in waiting rooms and to have the opportunity to travel around like and and visit different people and do home visits or even like palliative care visits like that for me with dogs and experiencing it with people now I think makes a big impact and so it has a huge like I I feel very grateful again to know my vet who will come to my house if any of my dogs or ponies or goats or chickens or sheep or whatever else I want a pig next I'll be watching Clarkson's farm I want those little orange pigs they're so <laughs> cute with little spots on them oh they're so cute um and my nan uh had had pigs on um our our family farm and before a long long time ago and so yeah for me I think that's incredible and and I suppose what I want to say to everyone is is don't let anyone else's inhibition stop you and what would you say to anyone listening and thinking about maybe just hearing you and being really inspired by what you're talking about I think absolutely go for it I can genuinely say like in all the stuff that I've done even pre-vet school like the traveling I've done and the, the bits and pieces I've never regretted saying yes to an opportunity ever. I, you know, I think, I, I think you would regret saying no. And sometimes you say yes to something that doesn't work out, but that's fine because you've done it and you know now. But just say yes, like just, just say yes because I don't think you ever regret it. I think you regret the no's, um, but never the yeses. It's a learning. If you didn't like it, you learned something. But if you say no, you don't get any of that learning. Mega, absolutely mega. Now, Kate, this has been a pleasure. I'd love us to jump in again, maybe six months, maybe a year down the line. Sure. You yeah. Game? yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's lovely chatting to you, Lauren. Opportunity, opportunity. She says yes to opportunity. Well, Kate, it's been incredible. I've loved talking. Your journey towards being a vet. I know we were saying life is a vet and you're like, it's not yet, but it's coming. <laughs> it's um, like- you're already on that path it's mega I'm so proud of you I'm so happy for you I know I've known you right from the start of this journey and well before the start really Lauren gosh it's been a while hasn't it yeah literally I mean I suppose your passion for dogs your passion for animals your passion for working in animals has been there a long time and I'm I just think incredibly proud incredibly happy for you and so pleased you're on the adventure like what a cool adventure thank you so much it's been really lovely chatting to you well, that was this episode of the Sex and Squirrel podcast. Kate has been amazing and I know you're all wishing her really well in her vet journey and hoping to hear from her again really soon. Join us for the next time where it's going to get a little bit interesting. We'll see you there.